things that I had missing in my life. One of them was community and um, a community of people who were, you know, helping each other. And I had a sponsor who was, uh, had a Buddhist leaning, wasn't really in a Theravada path, but um, fortunately through him, uh, pretty early on in my sobriety, he, he uh, gave me a pretty powerful teaching that my brain was just another organ in my body and that it uh, wasn't me, that, um, that I could just listen to the brain and observe it and uh, allow it to do its brain stuff. And um, that was pretty crazy to have basically my first Buddhist teaching be about not self, but uh, it was a really powerful pointer for me. And uh, I began um, connecting the dots on my own for a while and then found I needed more of a community outside of AA that was Buddhist based. And I found Seattle Insight, and it's pretty profound to be here today because it was about 10 years ago that I came here for the first time and sat with Seattle Insight Meditation Society and Rodney Smith. And I was like, oh, these are my people. You know, I, I was so grateful to have found a community that was speaking my language. It was, he was talking about dependent origination, and, and I was like, oh, I, I, this is exactly what I need to hear. It's like how I'm creating myself in every moment. And, um, and so Sims has been a huge community to me, and there's a lot of great friends in the room. And uh, luckily through Sims, I, I connected to Clear Mountain as well. And it's really catalyzed, meeting this community has really catalyzed my practice in a way that I hadn't anticipated. It also helps that I empty nested and I just had two kids like no longer in the house anymore. So uh, I have more time to practice too. And, uh, but I really feel like the the Dhamma is holding me, um, provides me a sense of refuge um, and a, a way to uh, deal with all the uncertainties and uh, uh, difficulties that continually arise. Um, so, yeah, very grateful for that, for this community, for our teachers, for the Buddha. Thank you. Sadhu three times. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. And people shouldn't feel rushed if it runs a little over five or six or seven minutes. It's, it's okay. Make sure to hold the mic really close to your mouth, too. Okay. So keep the mic. I'm Kirk Curry. Um, how I came to uh, Buddhism is a uh, well, start in 2008. I uh, had a big motorcycle accident, um, broke both legs, was in a coma for two weeks. Um, and then after that, the world just seemed kind of hilarious with like the egos and everything. Um, it kind of stripped mine away for a while, which was really cool. Um, but I took up like drinking a lot, drugs, and uh, kind of found out that wasn't the way. And then I found a book by Thich Nhat Hanh. I think it's Being Peace. And uh, the, oh, the practices really resonated with me. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't want to hear my own voice. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I was still drinking and everything and uh, 
doing the practices, and I kept reading that book over and over again. And uh, eventually I found um, Ajahn Brahm and the Buddhist Society of Western Australia. And I got into meditation, and uh, through meditation, I realized that drugs and alcohol just mess with the mind, and I couldn't meditate. So eventually I was able to give up that slowly. Um, and then as soon as I heard it, Nisabo and Kovalo were coming here, I was really excited for this whole community too, and it's really helped my practice. Thanks. from Bellingham almost every Saturday to be here. Hi, is that good? <laughs> um, so hi, I'm Brianna. Um, I live in Tacoma. Um, my uh, Dhamma story is a little less sweet and beautiful, I guess. Um, I, I think I was always searching my whole life. I was sort of greedy for the answers, and I was really far from getting anywhere close to them. And then um, back in 2018, I was fortunate enough to be hanging out with um, a, f uh, a sort of acquaintance and her mother who were talking about the ego and they were throwing it around in a way where I was just like, what are they talking about? I couldn't understand it at all, but I really, really wanted to. And it was one of those, one of those experiences that make you feel like, uh, you know, that not everything is an accident. Um, and so I went away and I read Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth, which uh, created in me an opening that felt really profound. And from there, I went on this whirlwind adventure of spirituality. And I just looked in my house and I had all these spirituality books lying around. Um, and Buddhism was sort of the core, but not the sort of Buddhism like this. It was sort of like the... Um, the pieces that I was cherry picking. So I was, I was doing a lot of ego work and I was not meditating. I was actually doing a lot of off the cushion identifying and deconstructing my ego in just day to day, like recognizing my judgments and whatnot. Um, and then I, I got really grounded. I started meditating more. Um, and I got so grounded that uh, I was just, I thought that like the whole point was just to to cease, sort of, just to be grounded. And then the universe or life or whatever threw me for a loop and I jumped into uh, like pagan stuff and witchcraft and I was like, I'm a witch. And, um, and I, was <laughs> I, was, I went into lots of ritual things and folk stuff and all of this wild stuff to really open me up in ways that I was, uh, I needed because I had become t maybe too grounded. <laughs> um, and then it sort of, it spiraled and I started getting into he healing traumas in a way that I, I, I didn't realize I really needed. I think we all need to heal in order to actually go on the path and doing that and healing and con deconstructing the ego. Um, and then I, I sort of found my way back to a more stable mix of all of these things and Buddhism um, which was always sort of the core became actually, I, I found it could actually hold all of that in a way that um, is really beautiful and, and is also not closed off to other things. So um, yeah, so that's how I got here and uh, it's just sort of been a deepening and a sort of rubbing away, sanding away at that ego. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. I'm not very good at impromptu talking, but I'll try. Is this loud enough? <laughs> OK. What's your name? My name is Kate. I was from Thailand. And of course, being from Thailand, I learned Buddhism since I was very young. And I learned meditation, too. And I pray and all that. But I, I did very well in Buddhism class. But <laughs> I even got awards, but I could not say that I understood it. I mean, I understood it logically, intellectually. Well, not even intellectually. I was just, I could memorize list of things, right? But it, it doesn't come to me. Um, you know, it doesn't sink in until I, I came to the US and I listened to uh, some teachers. Uh, you know, starting with uh, Pema Chodron, uh, Ekato, um, and then what changed me tremendously was my retreat with Lee Bracington. Um, he connected all the dots of the teachings that I learned in Thailand, but I could not put them together. <laughs> but somehow he connected the dots, and I understand everything, at least in intellectually, I understood it. I understood what Buddhism is about, and I sort of have an idea of how to progress onto the path. And of course, Lee is a jhana master, so I learned, some, I learned that some outer state of consciousness is possible. Um, uh, so from there, I start to have more faith <laughs> of, <laughs> of you know what this is all about also i still did not understand it uh, i at the time i still could not meditate all that well until i learned quite a few meditation techniques from bhikkhu analyo and that changed everything um, i bit by bit i learned my, my meditation progress. And I just want to give an encouragement to everyone that don't underestimate yourself. And my, my teacher, Lee Bracington, said this too, that he said, people who come to the retreat always underestimate themselves. They thought they came and they thought, oh, their samadhi is not very good, but people end up could doing jhanas, even though they don't think they could. So I just want to give an encouragement to have, to have faith, not just in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, but also in yourself, because the Buddha is in you too, and you will blossom when you practice, and the time is, is right. It will just come, and it will be a surprise. So just keep practicing. Um, what else? Right. So at this point, um, you know, previously I was, you know, in the worldly realm and all that, and um, you know, things in the worldly realm used to be the most important things to me, of course. But now, gradually. The worldly realms kind of taking a backstage, and what is most important in life is now my spiritual practice. And um, everything else sort of just drop away into the background, and it is beautiful. And I just want to give, an, again, an encouragement to everyone. And this is a wonderful community. And that's why I keep coming here. And I would like to thank Ajani Sabo for creating this beautiful community. Because without a good, beautiful uh, Kalayamita or the Dharma friends, it, it would be difficult to progress on the path. So I just want to thank you, everyone, for their presence. Thank you so much.
And if you're on Zoom, you can raise your hand as well, and we can call on you. We can spotlight you on this TV as well. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm Dory. I didn't want to come up because I'm really shy, uh, but I realized that today, pretty much today, is my three-year anniversary of coming to Buddhism practice. Um, so it feels appropriate to, to share a little bit um, of my story. Um, I have been really interested in meditation for a long time, and I actually did a lot of training in mindfulness and meditation in graduate school many years ago, but I um, have a genetic lung disease and never felt that I could meditate because the, the way it was taught to me was always the focus on the breath, and it was just so uncomfortable for me to focus on my breathing. Um, fast forward to six years ago or yeah six years ago i got a lung transplant um that's why i wear a mask because i'm immune compromised um and i can breathe <laughs> so um i've wanted to get into meditation since then but um it always seemed too hard to drive across town and go to classes and so the pandemic actually opened up an opportunity for me um, to start taking classes online um, and thanks to David Arterburn, actually, um, who I work with, um, David had told me about Sims, and I started doing classes with Sims and met several people who were coming to this community starting about a year and a half ago, Katie McKenna and Jean Myers. Um, and so I started coming here in May, and it's just been, I think, like many others have mentioned, it's like finding this community just feels, it's the highlight of my week. It's, um, I just really appreciate you all very, very much and the practice. Um, and, and yeah, it's just been kind of a deep dive and I just feel like a sponge soaking you all up and the, the teachings up and, um, and it's just been really meaningful. So thank you. Okay, testing, can we hear? Okay. So it seems like a slight theme that I've been noticing with people coming up here is like an anniversary of some sort. Oh, Teresa, sorry, Teresa. So anniversary of some sort is kind of a theme, and it's a th so when I heard that, I was like, I was already thinking, and it's like maybe today's the day because it's an anniversary of sorts for me too. Um, so there's like many different stories I know I can tell about my path. Um, I think there's one I'm gonna just focus on today because of the anniversary. And the anniversary is actually, it's been about a year since I've been coming here. Um, so around this time. Um, I'm kind of, I don't know the exact day. I just know because um, by the time Easter came around, uh, it was, I was already coming here at least a month. Um, and also the anniversary kind of lines up with the, uh, when you, the war started with, uh, between Russia and Ukraine. And so that was my starting point of the motivating factor to come here, interestingly enough. Um, so prior to a year, like a year ago, I was already listening to people like Thich Nhat Hanh, I was already introduced to mindfulness 
meditation as a mental health therapist. I was already like um, providing it in my, you know, in my practice. I'm doing groups, and that's the very interesting thing is that anytime I did a group, not nervous, nervous in front of you all. <laughs> so very curious, but um, so it started before a year ago, and so I was already familiar. Remember what was happening in the news between Russia and Ukraine, and I noticed this intense anger that came up, um, in particularly um, towards Putin. And but I knew through Thich Nhat Han that this anger could be transformed. And so, but I needed some assistance because the people around me just enabled the anger because they agreed and they were just as angry. So, but I knew that that's not the path and I needed a community. So I was like, I already heard about, you know, Nishabo and Clear Mountain Monastery through attending a yoga at the cathedral. And so I was like, uh, it was always on my to-do list to come. And at that point, after hearing like, the news and noticing the anger and noticing that like there's a path out of the anger by going in. I just knew that I needed support, like extra support to do that, like through community and that I had to come on Saturdays and that was the path and just, it was a clear message. So I came that Saturday and interestingly enough, Nishabo, he was talking about the war and talking about Putin, and he kind of made a comment, something like, um, you know, you can have a picture of Putin, and if you bow <laughs> to it, is that how it goes? Something like that. Okay. As a, as a teacher. As a teacher. And, uh, getting rid of anger. Yeah. Teacher of getting rid of anger, teacher for me also of, of compassion and loving kindness. Um, and that was my, yeah. Was my teacher, um, so bowing to Putin as a teacher. Uh, so I was like, "That's the way." Uh, wow! Like the first time I'm here, <laughs> I got an answer. Okay, how convenient. So I, <laughs> I was like, "I'm going to do this," but um, the only problem with that is that my um, partner, as I mentioned, you know, uh, I was just surrounded by people who are in agreement with the anger, and he is definitely one of those, and definitely did not like Putin, had it out for him for many years. Um, <laughs> and so I was like, okay, how am I gonna approach this conversation? So I decided that I was, and I said, yeah, you, you, got, you know, I learned something neat um, my first time going there, and I explained what I learned, and he's like, I couldn't stand this, a picture of Putin in the house. <laughs> no, no way. <laughs> I couldn't look at it. I would get so disgusted. And so I was like, okay, all right. But there's got to be a different, it's got to be a way. So I thought, <laughs> I got really creative. And, um, and I also kind of am a deep processor and, and think deeply. And so that stand an object had to have a lot of significance for me. Um, it couldn't just be any old stand an object like a flower or, or, or phone or something to that I can bow to. So I decided, I was thinking, thinking, I decided and I settled on this teddy bear that I got when I was born. It's the longest, like I still kept it. It's the oldest teddy bear. It's pretty raggedy, but it, I picked it because it's the teddy bear that I, it was my first gift ever, ever from my father. And um, so my father had his, a lot of suffering, a lot of suffering that he passed on to others, and including me, um, more so others than me, and definitely himself with his judgments towards himself. So, and then, I kind of realized, um, you know, in some ways, there were similarities with, between my dad and Putin in the suffering aspect of things. So that choosing the teddy bear was kind of, kind of representing both of them. Um, and 
and so what I've been, and I started, and I started to actually bow, um, and it was not just bowing, you know, um, as a teacher for compassion and loving kindness, uh, you know, uh, towards Putin, but also my dad. And I was already in the path of like forgiveness of my dad, so, um, but it eventually came, you know, um, helped out with that to peace and now some more compassion and love kindness, um, you know, towards Putin. But one of the other things I kind of um, realized mm, was that both of them just kind of, you know, the analogy I give is like, both of them, my dad and Putin and others alike, um, isn't like they're choosing the path of suffering and causing harm to others completely intentionally. Um, it's just that they never had anybody guide them in the tools. And the tools are like the clouds in the sky that can block the sun that we all have in us. And I realized that both my father and Putin just didn't have the tools to clear the clouds so they can let their sun shine through and the light shine through that we all, I think, have inside. So that also helped me be self-compassionate towards myself when I make mistakes, kind of always knowing that I, you know, sometimes the clouds will come and I, you know, to just have to use the, all the meditation tools to clear the t clouds and then the sun will just kind of shine through. So, yeah, I think it made me realize that we all have that and kind of look at it differently and people differently. So I think that's my, yeah, <laughs> conclusion, so. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Do you want more beer? Yeah. <laughs> Do you want more beer? Do you want more beers? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> more beers, more beers. <laughs> Nicknamed that one Teresa's Teddy Practice. So, yeah. um, the person on Zoom who has their hand raised, uh, just unmute and um, introduce yourself and go for it. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, my name is Matt, and I'm actually coming to you guys from Athens, Georgia. So I came to the Dhamma by kind of a long road. I was actually brought up in the Southern Baptist tradition and that didn't work for me after a while. And I started going to re uh, Dhamma recovery as a part of my uh, recovery from alcoholism. And part of that is meditation. And once I started meditating, I started to find some of that peace that I couldn't find anywhere else. And so I just started trying to learn more about that and develop my knowledge and my practice. And that led me through to Bhikkhu Bodhi and um, Tanisara Bhikkhu and Analeo and just sort of progressed to the point that I was practicing on my own, but I wanted to reach out and try to find a larger community. And while the pandemic was a terrible thing, one thing it did, I did find was this proliferation online of places and groups that I could connect to that I had no resources around in where I live. Just, you know, so eventually I discovered uh, Clear Mountain and when I started coming in, just to the Zoom meetings, I feel like I'm sitting in the room with everyone. It's just a very welcoming and a a wonderful group. So that's kind of how I got here, and uh, I appreciate this group. It's a it's it is a it's a great thing. So thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you.
have time for one more. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Chia. Uh, you might have seen me walking around with a camera <laughs> a few months ago. Uh, so I, I think uh, my own story is probably not as um, uh, striking as some of the many uh, inspirational examples we heard earlier. Uh, for me, I was born and raised in Taipei, Taiwan, so Mahayana Buddhism is a default, it's a cultural backbone. And for me, I resonate with Kay it was more like some sort of theory we memorized and understood. So we thought we understood, but like a, right from the book or some sort of academic subject. And I was in a Buddhist household. I remember H.A., my dad, you know, dragged me before sunrise, and we just bow every three steps and took many steps to get up to the mountain and then uh, get to the temple and then recite some sort of sutra in a group around a big table, and there's like huge, beautiful uh, Buddha statues, right, in, uh, in the hall. So that was the cultural background. And for me, uh, the theory of Buddhism was something I knew that could be helpful, but I didn't know how to tap into it. And fast forward to 2013, I had been in the U.S. for a long time, uh, and then um, have a stressful job, and um, and then uh, like neighbors noisy, couldn't sleep well, and other things, and then I had shingles, and I realized like ah, this doesn't feel right. I think I need an intervention, and then other things didn't go well. So I realized I probably need to explore Buddhism because that was what I grew up with. Uh, and then through a, a former f uh, partner, I learned about uh, Goinka, the 10-day course. And I must say that um, I was full of doubt uh, when I wanted to give it a try. So the fifth hindrance. Uh, but um, I, I still decided to give it a try. And because my full-time job is a scientist, I took some test tubes with me. <laughs> Uh, I was thinking, how can this be free, a community like this, and uh, just like welcoming everybody and food and shelter for 10 days, and uh, you can walk away anytime, like, just like, I am going to see whether there is some sort of substance they use, and if I see anything, I will capture it in my test tubes, <laughs> and then go to my other scientist friends, and we'll use mass spectrometry <laughs> to determine what that substance is. And so it was really the fifth hindrance, like <laughs> part of a, part of an energy that I carry with me into that ten day course. And you could probably guess that it worked. Uh, fourth or fifth day, maybe some of you had the same experience. One morning, I couldn't stop weeping. Uh, started to see how things fluctuate, the pat, uh, ri uh, rising and passing away. Right, that is just the nature, and how much I was trying to resist that. I started to see that, yep, the passing of my loved ones, my siblings who are dear to me as someday they, they are aging and they will leave. That thought is still kind of difficult for me to embrace, but that's the reality. Uh, so I think that's the moment it clicked uh, and uh, made me realize the importance of practice. So I went out of that 10 day uh, session, blissful. I would just never feel so relieved, just much lighter. But then I also realized how much of a, a creature of a habit I am. Uh, 2013, after I attended this thing, I felt much more confident. There was a way, but I couldn't make it into a routine. So what did it take? A pandemic. <laughs> the silver lining from a pandemic is somehow through online things and like this, I was able to sit every evening. Uh, and then. Now I'm going to explore gently without a lot of craving, see when I could add a morning sitting session uh, into my daily routine. So that's where I am. Um, and it's so wonderful to have all of this and have great teachers. Um, and um, I, I think we can accomplish a lot ourselves and also together. Thank you very much.
that's the second best Goenka story I've ever heard. <laughs> the first best I know someone who tried to lead a, a revolution in the attic of one of the places. So, <laughs> so uh, thank you everyone for, for sharing that, for those who took the leap and to come up here. And uh, Teresa, if you ever want to bring your teddy bear up to the gathering, I think we'd like to meet him. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a little bit of time now just for Q&A or questions or anything people want to bring up that, that came up, including sharing um, something that you'd like to share as well. Uh, even though you won't be formally up here, there's space for that too. So just raise your hand and we'll have a mic runner come over to you. And if you're online or on Zoom, just raise your electronic hand or type into the chat and we have a little time. And it can also just be expressing something for anyone who came up and whatever sort of on your mind or heart. Well, then I can start. I just want to say, Teresa, right? Uh, it's interesting that the same, I would say, trauma brought me here um, to Buddhism, but not the same anger, though. Uh, the anger to the world, I guess, to the people that um, only recreate the anger and um, I was just angry at people being angry and hateful to each other and I just wanted to stop it within myself with the and um, yeah yeah and I'm still on the path <laughs> to get there but it's interesting to hear that you also came here because of that thank you Well, thank you all who shared their, uh, you know, stories of how they uh, came into or progressed along the path. I could relate to every single one of them in different ways, and I think that others might have felt the same way too. And I think what I just realized also from my experience is that kind of the first step is the first noble truth of like we first recognize their suffering. I kind of like that's how people, uh, you know, turned into deeper, it looks like. And I think when we come in that, you know, we listen to teachings about, okay, there are causes to suffering that we have not been thought of before. We think it's external, we think it's other things, right? And also we are, uh, you know, we start learning that, well, there is a, there's an end to it potentially, right? Uh, and, you know, teachings around that, which we have not been introduced before maybe or thought about it. And there are ways to go about it, you know, doing things that we wouldn't think that we would do. Uh, like, you know, uh, picking up a bear and thinking that, you know, that's our teacher, right? Um, so, I, yeah, that's kind of very rich, so I appreciated everyone. I want to share that. And I hope, and I also heard that there's a focus on community, uh, which is something I'm kind of struggling with personally, and I hope that this is also, um, you know, uh, kind of a, a start, not just like a, uh, you know, kind of continue along that and make that connection as I felt like this morning. So, uh, thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Joseph? Thank you, Ajahn. Um, my question is, um, uh, I'm interested in preparing for grief like training the body and mind to be prepared for the experience of grief. And because uh, I don't really know what to expect in the body. I don't think I've had any extreme forms of loss yet in my life. I've had a couple of relatives pass away. So I'm doing some the Winhoff method, you know, cold exposure. Apparently he did that uh, when his wife passed away. And apparently there's something about cold exposure that um, helps with grief and loss. And then my question is what your experience with that is in terms of the, your practice. And um, how can we and I'm also noticing uh, in my uh, emotion wheel that uh, the opposite of surprise is uh, intrigue. And so I, my question is, is like, 
can we be intrigued by grief or I guess I'm more worried about being surprised by grief and I don't want to be surprised by grief. I'd like to train so that I can benefit myself and others and how to prepare for grief. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, since we are foregrounding other voices, does anyone have something to chime in first on that who's confronted grief? Juanita? Uh, let's get her uh, a mic, perhaps. Oh, Scott. Uh, you, I'm sorry. You, you, no, you can't prepare for grief unless you've really experienced it. <laughs> That's my experience. It was, oh, this is Scott, by the way. Um, uh, when my mom died, I, I knew she was dying. I, when she died, I was not expecting it. I was surprised, and the grief was hard. But if you're expecting that someone's going to die in your life, um, there is grief groups, and they really helped a lot because they helped with the processing. But I, I, I don't know how you can prepare for something like that. It's like preparing for sex the first time. You just don't know what it's going to be like until you're there. Sorry for the weird analogy. <laughs> Thank you. Juanita. Three years ago, my family get into the car accident, four of them die. So I'm so thankful for the mindfulness that I have been practiced every day. So when I arrived at the funeral, and I can see that my brother, who lost everybody in his family, just collapsed. And I realized that um, that's the way it is, you know. And then I organized and tried to be calm. And then I remember my teacher, the abbot, Abbot Papusing. He said, if you cry, go ahead, cry, but knowing you're crying. If you're sad, go ahead, sad, but knowing you're sad. The knowing, the mindfulness, sati, is will help you to grow this. But if we don't practice mindfulness and the have sati, then you will get into the stream of sadness and grief. Then the condition of everything, we not, we not, I mean, the, the practice is really help. This is how we prepare the practice to, to, to be mindful uh, with our feeling and emotions. Every time we feel sad, okay, I'm sad. But we didn't prevent from the sadness and the grief. But knowing, when we knowing, when I feel myself, when I feel, no, oh, I'm sad now. And then the, the sadness or the grief is not so, so big. The emotion is not so big. So that, that's how I, I, I deal with the grief and the sadness when the, um, with my experience of losing ever four in my family accidentally from the uh, 60 years old to the 10 years old grand uh, niece. So this has really helped me the whole time that I have to deal with uh, try to sorting them out. Every things in the house is their things and we have to get rid of it and and I stay with my brother two two months to do all of this and every every you know accident is so so big 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 thing in the family. We and we didn't prepare even we chance every morning no we are subject to old age which you know we will depart from the world one we, we chant every day maybe it helped in some certain but i think to be mindful to have the sati is very very important in it, every emotion that we have so the meditation and practice daily mindfulness that is that's the way to deal with any any emotion grief hatred or anger or anything but it really helped with the grief it to myself. Thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Mary, I saw you put your hand down, but I'd certainly be interested in hearing what you had to say, if you're willing. Thank you, Ajahn. Hello, everybody. Um, I really have very little to add. Um, 
But I do agree that we can't prepare for this. We can't prepare for some of the biggest things that hit us, except that we prepare every day. Um, my dad died when I unexpectedly when I was 27, and I didn't have a practice then. But I did know enough to watch what I was feeling and give myself permission that everything I was feeling was okay. I had never been through anything like this. I gave myself permission to feel it all. And like Juanita said, just feel it all. Um, now, I, with the practice, I think that one of the things that is a good daily practice is to look at the little losses that you have every day and see how you react to them, the little losses that happen throughout the day and to look at them. And um, that this practice that we have can hold any reaction that we have. It can hold it, it can nurture it, it can look at it, it can turn it to gold. So to really be able to hold all our reactions now is great practice practice for when the big one comes. <laughs> um, the other thing I would say is not to lose the person that you loved to death, not to lose them to that this death is their memory. Um, it's easy to get focused on the dying process and forget all the living that the person has done. So mm -hmm. please remember your life with that person. And that I find brings happiness, even in the midst of grief, to have known someone and to have loved someone. So great love means great pain. But there we are, caught in the human dilemma. Thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Ajahn, do we have time for a question from YouTube? We don't. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, just to, I'm sorry, YouTube questioner, uh, Wednesday or next Saturday, um, you know, and, and just to add on to that, um, when Long Person Meda lost his mother, uh, he was in the car with a retreat leader driving up, or a, a, someone driving up to Seattle, and, uh, and he held his hand and, and cried for a bit. And like, there's a difference between poignancy and the added layer of, of suffering that comes from having something ripped away that you're feeding off of. And, um, it's okay to have those notes of poignancy and you know, our, our suffering and our loss is what binds us together. It's, it's our shared humanity. And, um, there's a really powerful story of a woman who, uh, she lost her son, um, when he was a toddler to a car, um, he got hit and on the way back from the morgue, um, she said, I, I can't, she heard kind of a voice in her head that said like, you can't let this break you. And so she dedicated her life to, um, going and comforting other parents who'd lost kids because no one else could speak to their pain. And I think that's the essence of, of the path is that if you really realize how painful life is for a lot of people and the shared thread of suffering, um, the only reaction is to throw ourselves into, into this path and to giving the largest gift we can give, which is to make ourselves a refuge. And the, when we suffer deeply, we're able to actually open ourselves to empathy in a way that we wouldn't be able to otherwise. So it can be a gift in that sense. Um, so not to romanticize suffering, not to cling to people in a way that's unwholesome, to recognize poignancy, but then to cultivate a refuge unto yourself so that when tragedy does strike, you are, you are strong and to use it as a spur towards practice. Um, this world is not a refuge. It's an opportunity to learn and give. And that's, that's all. Okay, so, um, and thank you for everyone who shared uh, all that. 